Okay, um, we'll go ahead and start. So um, welcome everyone. I'm Ann Russo and I use she, her pronouns. I'm the director of the Women's Center and I also teach at DePaul in the Department of Women's and Gender Studies. Um, for a visual description, I am a white woman with grayish brown hair and I'm wearing a black shirt and a black scarf. Again, I want to welcome everyone into this space and into our conversation exploring disability justice, care, and abolition with Kelly Hayes, Akemi Nishida, Rise, and Kennedy Healy. So please first join me in welcoming them into this space. So excited to be having this conversation with you all and to welcome you. You know, just welcome you, welcome you, welcome you. I want to thank also all those who helped me make this event happen, including um, one of the key organizers who is Kennedy Healy, um, who's the founder of Crip Crap Media, and also Gwen True of DePaul's Accessible Futures, Julie Moody Freeman, who's the director of African and Black Diaspora Studies and the Center for Black Diaspora, Maria Ferreira, who's the director of the Center for Community Health Equity, Rose Spalding, the director of the Peace, Justice, and Conflict Studies Program, Allison McCracken, Director of American Studies, Gen Ginger Hoffman, Director of Community Service Studies, Rocio Ferreira, who's the Chair of Women's and Gender Studies. So I just want to thank you, thank you, thank you for all of your help in getting the word out and supporting the event and just being like excited about it. I also want to thank the Women's Center staff, Aviv Goldman and Grace Siegelman, who are here helping with the event and also help me to publicize it, get the word out and also Keish Lozano, Shamim Razak, Anna Mulk for help with publicity and just generally keeping the Women's Center community going. And I wanna thank our captioner, uh, Rhonda Lair, and our ASL interpreter, Car Carmen Sanders for contributing to our event this evening. Really appreciate um, you all. And now I'm gonna briefly bring in Gwyneth True, um, who's the founder of a group on campus called Accessible Futures. And I just wanted to give Gwen the opportunity to um, say hello and to say a word or two about the organization. So Gwen. Sorry, it wouldn't let me unmute until you asked me to. Um, hi, thank you all so much for being here, especially Kennedy and all of our wonderful participants tonight. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Accessible Futures. It is a student organization at DePaul University that we started in 2021 after seeing a need for inclusive disabled community on campus. And so this is a student organization that all students who are interested in advancing disability justice are invited to participate in regardless of personal disability status. Um, and we're just really excited about it. Um, we have done some really fun and energizing organizing already, including um, we organized the uh, a teach-in with the Global Justice Teach-in Committee of uh, Queering Communities of Care, and I have the link to that recording. Um, we did a quick series on navigating the Center for Students with Disabilities, and currently we're working on a proposal for a disability cultural center, which I am going to need all of your help with. So that's what we've been up to. I'm going to share a link in the chat in my email. And so if you're interested in any of Accessible Futures resources, our social media, joining our DHUB page, our Discord, Instagram, all those things, um, I'm going to put the link to it in the chat. And thank you again for having me and for including Accessible Futures in all of your organizing, In. OK, thank you. Thank you, Gwen. Um, so now I just want to thank, um, last but not least, I want to express my deep and wide gratitude to our facilitator this evening, Kennedy Healer Healy, the founder of Crip Crap Media, and also a, a DePaul Women's and Gender Studies alum, and just one of my favorite people. So Kennedy describes themselves as a fat, queer, Crip, Chicago-based consultant and media maker. Her work focuses on disability, accessibility, 
care, sexuality, media representation, and abolition. Most recently, they founded Cripcraft, a media company that makes media about disability by and for disabled people. And um, I'll put up the website uh, when I'm finished with my introduction. But I just want to say um, that Kennedy has been just a major co-collaborator collaborator and primary organizer of this evening's event. So I just want to thank you, Kennedy. Um, it was really your inspiration and vision and effort and attention and care and thoughtfulness that really brought this event together. And so I just want to say I so appreciate you and your work and I'm honored to have you as part of this and I'm really looking forward to more more upcoming events. So keep in touch with us, those of you who aren't um, involved in the Women's Center. Uh, we'll send out a link of how to get, you know, how to get connected with us. So now if everyone in the Zoom right now could help me through the chat to welcome Kennedy, who will, um, you know, go on with our event. Thank you, Anne, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, I just want to check, uh, can everyone hear me? Is the volume good? You can raise your hand or chat us if not. Um, I am a white femme person I'm wearing a gray and leopard top. Um, I have short brown hair and behind me you can see some books and plants as well as maybe parts of my um, electric wheelchair. I'm kind of like, I can like kind of mask on Zoom and like no one knows, but I like to, I like people to know that. Um, so yeah, welcome everyone. Thank you so much, Anne, for having us um, and building a container for this conversation. I think other students and former students of yours on the Zoom would agree um, that Anne has really taught us how to carve out space for radical conversation and how to fund it um, and bring a lot of people together to fund different projects. So thank you to all the co-sponsors as well. Um, in the spirit of accessibility, we want to invite people to do whatever you need to do to be comfortable in this virtual space. This might mean turning off your camera, leaving your computer to attend to your physical or mental health, lying down, standing up, standing, pacing, etc. I would ask that everyone please speak slowly when possible to make things easier for our transcribers, interpreters, and listeners. I'd also like to offer a content warning as topics like police violence and murder, prisons, institutionalization, medical trauma, care, and various systems of oppression may come up during this conversation or others. Um, so please do whatever you need to do to take care of yourselves or let us know if we can support with that. Beyond this, um, if there's ways we can support your access needs right now or throughout the talk, please let us know right now. I mean both times, but I'll give a moment right now. Um, you can do that through the hand raise feature and speak to the group. Um, chat the whole group, or if you want to message Anne directly in the chat, um, any of those methods work, whatever's most comfortable. Um, so anything folks need at this moment. Okay, yeah, please feel free to interrupt us. It's like a very access center space. So we will pause the whole show if like, one person can't access the content, so no one left behind. Um, to introduce sort of the conversation tonight, we created it on the topics of care, abolition, and disability justice, given the growing interest around how these concepts and movements work together. The mass global protests against police violence and murder of summer 2020 brought a range of demands for solutions to the problems of policing with increasing suggestions for alternatives like social workers and service providers. In response, many disabled activists cautioned against recreating death-making systems, knowing all too well how treatment and care are often terms that the state and other institutions 
used to describe social control mechanisms such as mandated reporting, involuntary commitment to psychiatric institutions, and the abuse, assault, and neglect that occur in care settings like large institutions for disabled folks, group homes, or your own home. Calls to defund the police brought up questions about the dangers of bolstering other oppressive programs and what true abolition might look like. Abolition is a framework that is rooted in ending slavery. It was created by black people and centers the liberation of black people from systems like police and prisons. Miriam Kaba describes it as not only about ending these violent systems, but also what we will build to maintain safety instead. She calls it, quote, becoming. Liat Ben Moshe and other members of the Abolition and Disability Justice Collective have drawn connections between abolition movements and move, abolitionist movements and movements for the deinstitutionalization of people with various disabilities. At the same time, the, the pandemic has forced discussions about care outside of private settings and circles. For a while, actions surrounding flattening the curve and protecting the mo most vulnerable were awarded among liberals. Media about caring for yourself, your family, and your community moved to the front page. An extreme crisis that was exacerbated by fascist federal government leaders brought many to take care into their own hands from checking on elderly neighbors to forming and participating in mutual aid networks. Issues and solutions surrounding care that disability justice activists like Leah Lakshmi, Piamsha Samara Singha in her book, Care Work, had been discussing long before COVID seemed more relatable to the general public as everyone's needs were amplified. This momentum, however, seemed quickly lost among most as the vaccine rollout, lifting of mask mandates and pressure for a return to normal led many folks back to individualist thinking. Throughout the entire pandemic, the lives and livelihoods of disabled people, seniors, people in prisons and congregate care settings, essential workers, BIPOC communities, and others have been debated as mass death of marginalized people continues to occur. As we face attempts to erase pandemic truths, like baffled responses to shortages of care and other workers, May we not forget the moments when the pandemic and surrounding political precarity were understood as events that could shift us towards futures rooted in disability justice. In many ways, this has already happened and I believe disability justice futures remain possible. Disability justice is a practice created by multiply marginalized disabled people in response to disability rights. Founders include Patty Byrne, Leroy Moore, Mia Mingus, Eli Clare, and Sebastian Margaret. Disability justice seeks collective liberation through sustainable cross-movement organizing. Organizing that has had care and abolition at its center, and that seeks to answer pending questions like, where do we go from here and how do we get there? I'm excited to introduce our panel of Chicago-based academics, writers, and activists to share some thoughts on these topics. Kelly Hayes is a Menominee author, organizer, photographer, and direct action trainer. Kelly co-founded the Lifted Voices Collective and the Chicago Light Brigade. Her written work can be found in Truth Out, Teen Vogue, Bustle, numerous anthologies, as well as her upcoming book, Let This Radicalize You, co-authored by Miriam Kaba. Kelly has trained thousands of people across the country in direct action tactics and movement strategies. She is also the host of Truth Out's podcast, Movement Memos. Akemi Nishida uses research, education, and activism to investigate the ways in which ableism is exercised in relation to racism, cis heteropatriarchy, xenophobia, and other forms of social injustices. 
She also uses such methods to work toward cross-community solidarity. She is the author of Just Care, Messy Entanglements of Disability, Dependency, and Desire, in which she examines public health care programs, as well as grassroots interdependent care collectives and bed space activism. She teaches at University of Illinois Chicago while also advocating for disability justice locally and nationally. Rise is a fat, black, disabled, gender fluid femme. Rise is a mediation facilitator, gender affirming and trauma informed care and disability justice educator, poet and birth slash postpartum slash grief and loss slash abortion care worker. They have been a healing practitioner for over 10 years and are deeply invested in disability justice, access, centering wellness for Black queer folk, trauma education, and rest. They are equally invested in daydreaming and hanging out with their support pup, Jelly Ferocious. Uh, with that, we'll begin some questions. Um, the panelists can feel free to answer them in whatever order is comfortable as things come to you. Um, and I would just remind everyone the first time you speak to describe yourself and you're welcome to also share pronouns or anything else you'd like the audience to know. Um, so our first question is, how did you find your way to work related to the topics of care, abolition and disability justice and or what meaning do they hold for you? I can go first, I guess. Um, hi, I'm Kelly. Uh, pronouns are she, her, or they, them. Um, I am a light-skinned Native person with long brown hair, and I am wearing black-rimmed glasses. The background behind me is blurred. So to speak to the question, um, I was part of the anti-austerity campaign to save Chicago's publicly funded mental health clinics about a decade ago under Rahm Emanuel. And I learned a lot from that campaign about the role of care in our struggles. Um, my strength that I was bringing to the table was direct action. I was able to help map out and execute some powerful actions, including the occupation of a clinic and multiple encampments. But this struggle was led by people who were being displaced from their clinics. So at any given time, most of the people who were being arrested for causing a disruption or occupying a clinic, or because the camp had been raided, were disabled people. There were also people in the camp who were unarrestable for different reasons, from medical issues to being undocumented. So at every stage of the work we were doing, there were layers of care and protection that had to be woven into every action we were taking. Um, back then, my body was in very different shape physically, and I was one of the more able-bodied people in the camp. And some nights, that meant me and my friend Babir might be awake at 3 a.m. pushing, pooling water off of tents to prevent them from collapsing on people during a storm. It meant long hours of jail support because we needed folks present when our people got out to make sure their needs were met, including things like medication. Um, but, you know, we ourselves uh, were also being looked out for a great deal by our comrades who tried to make sure we got enough food and sleep, especially when we weren't thinking about those things. Um, we sat in peace circles and healing circles with people in the camp uh, to reckon with some of the traumas people had experienced during the campaign, including police violence, and with some of the traumas that had driven people to join our protests such as having suffered in the absence of care that they were seeking or having lost a loved one to an overdose or a suicide. Um, the contrast between people who were fighting to access medical care while caring for one another as they held their ground and the police state, which was willing to fall down on the most vulnerable among us, really crystallized things for me and I think for a lot of other people who were involved. I had not started calling myself an abolitionist yet at that time, 
but what we were doing was abolitionist work in the way that Ruth Wilson Gilmore describes it. We were fighting organized abandonment. We were fighting to maintain structures of medical care that make premature death less likely. So in that sense, I think many of us were doing abolitionist work before we ever called ourselves abolitionists. I didn't really embrace the language around abolition until I started to get to know Miriam Kaba, who lived in the same neighborhood as me in Chicago around that time. Um, Miriam noticed some of the work I was involved with and started inviting me to work on projects with her. We wound up co-organizing a lot of direct actions together over the years and working on some defense committees together to try to free criminalize survivors of violence. I think that care has always been fundamental to the kind of change working, change making work I have done with Miriam, because we both believe in the importance of reciprocal care and that at the community level, our mutual investment in one another's survival is our greatest strength. When that investment in exceeds our investment in the system, I think we get a lot closer to our real potential as human beings, as activists, you know, as communities. But people tend to be very invested in the systems they depend on and to justify those systems, even when those systems harm them. So to truly radically depart from that, we have to care about the people that society tells us are expendable. As far as I'm concerned, that's ground zero in the fight against both fascism and the carceral state. And that means that incarcerated people, disabled people, unhoused people, trans people, and migrants have to matter, or we are simply in the process of surrender. So I see care work as a rebellion against disposability. Um, without it, I don't think our struggles have the potential to truly reshape anything. And since I mentioned the mental health movement, I do want to pay tribute to my fallen comrades, Helen Morley and Jeanette Hansen, who both told Rahm Emanuel they would die if their clinics closed. Tragically, Helen and Jeanette did die after losing their clinics. Their deaths are not considered homicides by this system, but their premature and wholly preventable deaths occurred due to organized abandonment, state violence, and a lack of care. And I think that's really important to think about in terms of how violence gets framed in this society and what gets counted as a violent death that was committed against someone and what does not. Um, so yeah, those are, I guess, my, my thoughts on that. Thank you. I will go. Hi, it's Rise, they, them. I am a brown skinned black femme. I have on a leopard print head wrap, glasses, pink lipstick, and a gold necklace with a green tank top. I'm sitting in front of a cyan blue wall um, on a very luscious green velvet couch um, with green succulent pillows behind me. How I came to care work um, is really, I was very invested in being a doctor, a neonatologist who specializes in the um, care of newborns and infants since I was a young person. Um, I also was a chronically ill young person um, and experienced a lot of medical fat phobia um, and continue to experience a lot of medical fat phobia. Um, so when I was an undergrad at the Paul, actually, yes, I... Um, got sick with a mysterious illness. No one could figure out what was wrong with me. Um, not that they actually tried. Um, all of the medical providers that I went to kept telling me I had acid reflux or I needed to lose weight or, you know, all the reasons <laughs> that basically say they don't really care. They just, I'm fat and that's why I'm sick, right? So um, I was sick for over half a year. Um, at the height of it, I had lost um, 30 pounds within one month. Um, as someone who's been fat all my life to be skinny, like that was not, that was a very disorienting out of body experience for me. All of my clothes were falling off. I was, you know, like it, going through finals, all of that. Eventually, and this is like a note to my privilege at the time, 
um, I was still on my parents' insurance. And so I was able to outsource a medical provider. But just think about like all of the Black people and fat people and fat Black people who are not listened to, who don't have health insurance or have very crappy health insurance, right? So I outsourced, went to a specialist. Um, they immediately like did a procedure, figured out what was going on. I was on medication for another full month um, before I even felt some type of relief. Through then I like had graduated, did all of that, like in the midst of this. Um, at the time I was really struggling and I was telling a friend um, and the friend suggested that I do, excuse me, um, I take up yoga. I was on the fence because a lot of the places that, you know, teach yoga are very white and colonized. <laughs> and I was like, I don't really try to do all of this. Um, but I did try, it did help my ease my mind. And also I was the only person that looks like me. So um, I started I got trained to be a yoga teacher. Right now I'm on a break because I'm considering what it's like, what it means to be a black person teaching yoga who learned from white people, who stole it from Indian people, right? Um, there's a lot of layers. But through that, I ended up expanding the practice, my meditation practice. I ended up expanding my circle keeping practice that I was doing before then. Um, and years later ended up being a uh, birth worker. And so how I came in, I ended up actually almost failing out of the poll trying to be a doctor um, because I had undiagnosed mental uh, mental illness. And that's also how I came to being a birth worker. So really um, not ending up participating in the medical industrial complex is what brought me to being a care worker now. Um, and in, in deciding to make the really difficult step of divesting from that when that was something that I had always knew or thought that that was the only avenue that I could show up for my people. And I think that was a really important catalyst for me because I was like, oh, okay, I can just show up for my people with the tools that I have already. And then I can just like build on those tools with other people who have different tools why didn't anyone tell me this? Like, so um, that's how I began my care work journey um, and just continue expanding. And then that's also how I started learning about abolition. Like the closer that I got to the things that I was good at in community, the closer that I got to people in community that shared my values. And then I started learning from them. So then I started learning about abolition through Chicago organizers who are unmatched, in my opinion, and also through a lot of online activists, activism. Online activism is a thing, it's, it exists and it's real, just, you know, so folks know. Um, and I'll stop there because later I wanna talk about like the intersections of the medical industrial complex and then the prison industrial complex and how like I wove those things together. Hi, this is Akemi Nishida. I use she, her gender pronoun. I'm a Northeast Asian femme presenting cis women with medium straight black hair with red sweater. Um, I live with, I was born with physical visible disabilities among other invisible conditions I live with. So I'm thinking about care specifically and how I find my way to work to think about these topics. And, you know, when you are born with visible physical disabilities, oftentimes you are kind of forced into medical care, surgery, whether you need it or not. So I certainly received medical care, even though I don't know if I want to use the word care to talk about kind of something forced on my body. But also I also I witnessed my disabled friends receive long-term care, like a daily assistant under the Medicaid. And also I migrated to this country means I did a lot of care work under the table to survive in this country financially. So I see that you know care as a setup where oftentimes in disability community, as Kennedy said, we it's it's hard to kind of distinguish what care and what violence, what's ableist abuse, because they all come together and doesn't enable care. 
But at the same time, at the more grassroots level, care is a way, like a reality of disabled life, right? Like that's how only way we can come together and hang out and just have fun with each other. So I see a lot of care we engage with each other to survive and thrive. Like I been part, I was part of care collectives where disabled people and ally came together to engage in more interdependent and alternative way to engage, to meet each other's care under the belief that we all need care. We all can provide care. And also I add, we all deserve care, right? Like hanging out with my disabled friends, care is a foundation, everybody got to chip in. So I, you know, when, before I got this job, I didn't really have money. So my friends get groceries from food stamp and I cook. While I cook, one of my friends from his bed used his fingers to find a movie to watch and his partner filed all the Medicaid paperwork. And so we all like chipping into uh, hang out together in the night to share dinner and watch movie and all that. So care, you know, can be contradicting words. It comes up in the different way at the different times in our life. Uh, it helps us to live and thrive and it sometimes used to oppress us as well. So I'll stop here. Thank you all. Um, I, I hope that'll be helpful in framing the rest of the conversation and thank you for like the work you're all doing um the next question is what systems does your work attempt to dismantle and what alternatives would you warn against um obviously like intersectionally that's a big question but if you want to highlight a couple or like where you kind of root yourself or like uh, focus from that'd be great Also, if there's any questions that you all want to pass on, that is also fine. Hi, Rise, they, them. Um, okay, let me look at the question real quick again. Okay, what systems does my work attend? So the deeper I got into care work, the deeper I got into abolition. Um, both in practice and in history, right? Um, so we talk about um, the historic, the history behind uh, law enforcement. That you know, originally they were patrol for people who escaped slavery, who, Africans who escaped slavery. And what we don't always talk about, which it should be more common knowledge, is that the medical industrial complex also is built on the enslavement and coercion um, and exploitation of Black people of all genders, right? Um, and as a birth worker, I am centered in that history um, that uh, if you could call him a doctor, um, a white man named Miriam Sim Marion Sims, who actually created a lot of the current uh, gynecological tools that you see in your doctor's office. Um, and those tools were created and based on his experimentations, his non-consensual experimentations on enslaved black women at the time, right? And he also did not believe in using um, any type of anesthesia or pain management either. And so when I think about these things, I think that the MIC and the PIC are intricately linked, right? So like if we are about, if we are talking about abolition, it's not just about prisons. Abolition is about abolishing all the systems that serve to harm us, right? All of the systems that serve to control us for their profit and amusement, honestly, because I don't think that it's just about profit. I don't think that um, people, <laughs> people keep us in chains just for money. I think they also do it because Pat, like in the same way that many people with uh, oppressive marginalized identities inherit that trauma. I think a lot of people who historically are in positions of power inherit that type of unearned entitlement also. Um, and that it is not a disorder. It is absolutely a choice to be that hateful and that greedy. Um, 
And so I think the difference though, between abolition when it comes to prisons and abolition when it comes to the medical industrial complex and care work is that no matter what the level or no matter who you are, we're always going to need care right? Like, but we are, we don't always need punitive systems, right? <laughs> and so in that, um, my work seeks to make sure that people know that there are no monoliths when it comes to care, nor are there any monoliths when it comes to conflict resolution. Um, and just conflict in general, like conflict is always going to happen. So we need to figure out how we're going to show up for each other without being punitive. And then care is always going to be needed. So we're going to have to figure out how to show up for each other without depending on the systems that the medical systems that are also very carceral, right? Like people are now starting to call um, to use the word psychiatric incarceration um, because many people who go into um, psychiatric facilities are, they are drugged in order to get them there, right? Um, what would it take for our communities to be able to show up without law enforcement of any kind, without social services of any kind, right? Like how can we build those structures? And also thinking about how abolition isn't an overnight thing, right? It's just like a step-by-step -step thing. Like how can we create the path where over time we just make all of these systems obsolete? You know, I don't think that like, and I think that because care is highly personal, um, to communities and to individuals. I don't think that people are, no one's never going to not need care, right? Um, and one of the things that I see in the birth community, which I can't stand, is particularly in, um, during the height of the pandemic, many, pe many pregnant people were turning to home births if they were considered low risk versus a hospital because they didn't want to get COVID, right? They didn't want to get COVID. They didn't want to experience medical violence, medical racism, all of that. And so there are a lot of birth workers who are pushing for more home, home births, but at the expense of poor and disabled pregnant people who don't have a choice but to have a, a birth in a hospital. Maybe their insurance doesn't cover a birth center or a home birth, you know, maybe because of their disabilities or they're considered not low risk for whatever reason, usually medical racism, they have to birth in a hospital because, you know, they don't want their children taken away because they, you know, but then they also have to risk dying in that hospital too due to medical ableism and racism. And so I really want um, folks to know, to not like pinpoint and zero in on one particular thing when it comes to care work and when it comes to abolition and disability justice, because that's how we basically cut ourselves off from each other and how we cut ourselves off from evolving. And, and we're gonna have to evolve if we want to build the communities that we're really saying that we wanna see. Hey, Kelly, uh, she, they. Um, so in terms of what my work is trying to dismantle, um, as a prison and police abolitionist, um, very clearly going after the carceral state, but as Rise indicated, that's much bigger, right, than cages and cops, because that shit is everywhere, right? Um, so many people in so many roles in our society have been conscripted into playing a part in surveillance and control, and particularly of marginalized folks, right? We know Black folks are targeted to the utmost. We know Indigenous folks, disabled folks, that we are, we are very much... Um, at the mercy of these systems um, in a number of situations. Uh, one example is something I experienced very recently when I was in for surgery. Um, just over a week ago, I was getting a tumor removed from the back of my neck. And while I'm laying there waiting to you know, get my anesthesia, I'm overhearing something happening with another patient where a man had admitted to the anesthesiologist, as, as well he should, that he had used three bags of heroin the day before. And now there's a debate between the anesthesiologist resident and the attending about whether they can proceed to treat this man who has a dislocated shoulder. 
And the resident's like, oh, but we can't give him anything because that's against the rules because he took these drugs. And the attending saying, we need to put his shoulder back. And for that, he needs pain meds. And, you know, I was so grateful that at least there was a senior person there who was saying, no, we figure out what the safest thing is and, and we do it, you know, and that that's what you do in an emergency. But when I woke up from my procedure, the first thing I heard in the recovery room before I even opened my eyes were nurses laughing. And they were laughing at that man. They were laughing about the fact that he had done heroin and admitted it to a doctor. They were laughing about the fact that he had um, apparently brought heroin with him and his belongings. His belongings had been searched and now security had been called. And, and I'm laying there thinking, okay, A, why the fuck did they search this guy's belongings? You know, it's like they had, sure, they had their, in their mind, they had probable cause, like they were cops, you know? It's like they, they couldn't just know this information and treat this man accordingly. Somebody had to step into that cop role. And sometimes that's people sort of taking things on themselves. And sometimes, as we know, it's mandated. People are put in the position of having to report things or being expected to treat people in certain ways. But in my experience, um, really, the idea of an alternative at all to anything carceral is a non-starter. We can, I don't believe we can jump off from a place of, of thinking about alternatives, particularly when we're talking about things that should not exist. I don't want an alternative to something that should not exist. I want the things that should exist. I want them to exist for their own sake because we need them. Um, you know, for example, I was in and out of institutions a lot during my 20s. Um, I had a misdiagnosed mental illness and I was abusing substances a lot and in really bad shape. And when I would wind up in jail and when I would wind up in an institution, a lot of the same things would happen to me. And a lot of the same attitudes surfaced from the people in front of me. And one thing that I remember really clearly, one of the distinctions that I remember between these sort of mental health settings where I was not allowed to leave, of course, um, and actual jails, is that the folks in the mental health setting wanted me to understand how lucky I was as a person who used heroin to be in a mental health setting versus a jail. Like this was my opportunity. Like this was like my scared straight moment or something. And it, it was absolutely horrifying to me that the, the extent to which these people had been taught to dehumanize the patients in front of them the people in need of medical care, who they went to school to provide medical care. I don't think those people came out of school with the idea to treat us in the way that we were treated. I think they were conditioned to be that way in the same way that prison guards become conditioned to mistreat human beings. Um, you know, maybe some of them walk into the prisons like that, but we know that there's a culture, right, that gets built into people. People become acculturated to that kind of carceral violence. And I very much think that that same sort of thing takes hold in these environments. Someone saying med medical education is very racist. I have no doubt of that whatsoever. But I've been in a lot of medical environments. And I will tell you that in these environments where you were being treated for something that is criminalized, um, it, it's on another level it ups the ante to what you experience in most settings because they really do take on a jailer mentality. And once someone takes on that jailer mentality, you are not a person anymore. And it was for me of like very eye-opening about what all of that is that, you know, when people, friends now will sometimes talk to me about like, oh, I'm struggling with mental health. Maybe I should check myself in. I tense up and I get really scared because I realize that they don't know what that means. And so I'm always willing to talk to people about what might be best for them and to do what they ultimately think is best. But to actually have to explain to people who haven't experienced like rehab, for example, what that looks like and how people actually get treated, um, I don't think most people understand that. And so, and, and how ugly it is. And I've been in Chicago in some of the nicer, you know, places, as it were, the places you go if you have decent insurance. And I've been in the hell holes where they send you when, you know, to disappear. And bad things happen in all of those places. And they happen particularly when there's a sense that you're there because you did something bad. And like, and, you know, 
control, things like um, we hear about in prisons, um, folks who need menstrual products being denied those or being rationed them in really embarrassing ways. I've experienced that in a mental institution that was not the you know, bottom of the barrel mental institution. It was just the way that the staff chose to act at this particular place because they were put in a position of power and control over another person in, in a particular way and told that this person's done something wrong. And part of their role is some sort of punishing or rehabilitative piece. In any case, alternatives impersonate. It's just always gonna be that way. So we need to figure out what needs to exist and how we grow it for the sake of having the things that we need and not for the sake of grasping at some reformation of what we don't want, including turning social workers into cops, which we don't want. This is Akemi. I'm thankful how Rise and Kelly is talking about how those control and surveillance is not like space specific, like uh, incarcerated spaces, but it continues to our daily lives, like everyday lives. And I'm thinking a lot when it comes to dismantling or undoing, I want to dismantle or like think about alternative to care industrial complex, how the uh, many long-term care, especially under the Medicaid or public health care is managed in this country. But under the care, uh, care industrial complex, care is increasingly turned into the site of capitalist value extraction, meaning care workers are exploited for their ability and capacities to care, or people who need long-term care are exploited based on how many hours or what kind of care they need because the, the Medicaid budget is the biggest budget comes from the federal to the state government. And then the, uh, the management of Medicaid and the public health care is becoming increasingly more subcontracted to the private care industrial complex from the state government. So again, the care became this site of money making where care workers and those who need the care are treated as if they're disposable right, kind of like um, as those companies and uh, industry receive the funding. And living in this oppressive society, we know that uh, or disability justice activists told us that a government or Medicaid will never meet the needs of marginalized community fully. And we know that in last couple of decades and how Medicaid is being given and met. But also living in this oppressive society means oftentimes the people, especially coming from marginalized communities, don't have any other option but Medicaid to receive long-term care they need, even though they're not perfect or they surveil um, people. Or at least we are taught or we are like to think Medicaid is only life savior, life saver for many uh, disabled people coming from lower uh, class background, but also same time living in this oppressive society means that many people coming from marginalized community are already engaging care in an alternative way because government care will never fully meet the care needs of theirs. For example, uh, many um, disabled people from undocumented migrant communities engaging in interdependent care supports for one another because there is next to no supports from the government. But then the challenge becomes like, how can we engage in such interdependent care relationship in more equitable and a justice way? How can we unlearn uh, how we engage in, uh, how we engage in care uh, in non-capitalist way? Because we are often taught, you know, when we think about care, we kind of internalize how care is imagined under capitalism which is care is given from care provider to care receiver in one way, way as if care is something we can package and give. And in that we totally ignores um, the care, for example, disabled people give and contribute to the society. So um, I'll stop here, but I do wanna um, think about how we can dismantle care industrial complex and also simultaneously 
experiment and explore together what are the alternative ways to meet each other's needs for care. Thank you all. Um, we're hoping to turn it over to Q&A in about 10 minutes. So I'm gonna to jump to, I had a question for each of you. Um, and if, if you would rather answer number three, we could also do that. Um, you could like do that instead of that one or put it in later. Um, number three for the audience was about like realities um, that the panelists works look to build and what care looks like in those realities. So maybe also in the Q and A, we can try to talk about futures and things. Um, so I'm gonna start with Kelly. Um, a lot of your work is about abolitionist organizing strategy. How do you see care show up in world building strategies? Well, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore tells us, abolition is about presence, not absence. So when I talk to people about abolition as an organizer, I am not just hitting them with facts and figures about why the cops are bad. I am talking with them about their heart's desires and their heartbreaks and what would actually transform their worlds for the better. And I think that's where a lot of abolitionist organizers are jumping off in their communities because we are given cops in place of virtually everything else. So getting people to imagine, um, since adding more and more cops actually isn't changing the math on our suffering, what would make life better? What would keep people alive longer? What would help us thrive? What do we need? And care is always part of that conversation because we live in an isolating society that tells you that if you are lonely, hungry, sick, hurting, or depressed, these are your problems to solve. If you need medical assistance that you can't afford, that's because you made the wrong choices. The opposite of a culture of disposability is a refusal to abandon. And that refusal will always involve care at a relational level between co-strugglers and in terms of the structures we create and demand to ensure our collective survival. I think we see that energy in a lot of the projects that people have brought forth in recent years from defund initiatives that have led to successful reinvestment in community services to groups that incorporate things like clearing circles and healing circles in their work and, you know, and healing work within the organizing itself, which is something that my own collective takes very seriously. Um, I'm thinking in particular of Monica Cosby, who talked to me about how women in prison formed social life support systems and how she would not have survived suicidal depression without that social life support system. I think some people understand that we are going to need that kind of connection and mutual concern if we are going to build anything sustainable in this era of catastrophe and in collapse, you know, where we are up against the rise of global fascism and really the continued devaluation of our lives. Um, you know, the opposite of that is, you know, not simply a refusal of those values, but a refusal to ban abandon one another and an insistence on caring for one another and seeing that, you know, we don't leave each other behind. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Rise. Um, you recently had an Instagram graphic that read, care work is direct action shared widely on social media. Could you elaborate on that sentiment for us? Yeah, so um, I used to go to a lot of protests. Um, and um, I remember, but then I haven't actually been to one for almost 10 years. And the reason for that is, um, so I'm from St. Louis and when um, the terrible situation in Ferguson happened, I saw uh, a lot of people showing their asses um, and a lot of organizers showing their asses. And it was, it was a lot, it was too much, <laughs> you know? And um, I understand 
urgency, right? But I think there is a difference between urgency because it's time to mobilize versus urgency that is um, rooted in white supremacy and is being misplaced and is being disseminated amongst each other, right? Um, and I think it's hard to know the difference sometimes when we're all hurting and we're all in shock and we're all trying to figure out what to do. But I know that as years pass and I was going to protest and actions that um, I saw that it wasn't a space for me. It wasn't a space for me and my disabled body. It wasn't a space for me and my fat body, right? There was no one taking care of each other. There was no one trying to set a steady pace for each other, right? At least the ones that I went to. Um, and then I would go on social media and then people would post, oh, if you're not in the streets, you're not doing anything. Or, you know, like if you're not uh, out here laying your body on the line, you're not doing anything. And I'm like, babe, I lay my body on the line every time I step out the door. What are you talking about? Right? Like, and so like not understanding that people's positionalities are different also. Um, and also not understanding that like disabled people do direct action also, right? Like there's an entire history. So many of the things that we have, like that we take for granted, like curb cuts are because disabled people put their cells and their bodies on the line to do what needed to be done for themselves and then the masses benefited. And so I was thinking about this and I was reflecting um, during the pandemic and the height of the pandemic and how um, because we couldn't be out in the streets, what was direct action looking like, right? It was looking like folks sharing recipes online. It was looking like people um, coming on Zoom and showing each other how to work the tech so that we could be together. It was looking like driving medicine or sharing medication with each other. All the things that disabled people have been doing, but we were doing it in vast number. And it was looking like disabled and chronically ill and neurodivergent people actually getting a mass um, following and being listened to in a way that I've never experienced before. Um, and it was looking like care workers actually being valued, even though that kind of went out the window by 2021, right? Um, because then everybody decided that masks didn't exist um, <laughs> or wasn't needed. And it was, you know, people, quote unquote, essential workers who weren't being paid, it was them being valued. And even though I don't want to be in a place where everyone is scared, my disabled, chronically ill self really misses the type of community that I experienced in 2020, I really miss it. And I don't know if we're gonna have it again. And I really hope we don't have something else like the pandemic <laughs> that like gets us there. I hope that we don't have this mass um, death and mass disabling event again for us to get back to that point, right? Where we care for each other in such an extensive way. And so that's why I was reflecting on all of that. And I created that post, Care Workers Direct Action. And at first I was scared to post it, to be honest, like, cause I didn't want <laughs> organizers to be, you know, in their feelings about it. Um, but at the same time, I was like, oh, well, <laughs> you know, like my people also need to be seen and need to feel like they're like they matter also. Um, and care work absolutely is direct action because again, like I said, we cannot survive if we are not caring for ourselves and each other. Like it it's just it's linked within us, right? On a community level, on an interpersonal level, right? Like the healing that we do that no one sees. Like care work is everywhere and so like one of my goals is to be a part of the movement to bring care work to a point where it can't be monetized because I feel like that is where the MIC will fall right like the MIC exists because it profits off of sick people right like I was talking to another disabled friend and they were like do you think that they could have actually made a vaccine that actually slowed the transmission rate and I was like, you know what? I didn't even think about that. But what they did was just made a vaccine that didn't kill you. <laughs> but at least one in five people are developing long COVID, whether they had a mild infection or not. And Pfizer and Moderna are making billions. 
right? They're making money off of sick people without actually tending to the very real and very intersecting and everyday needs of such sick people. So I want to build a world where care work cannot be monetized and exploited by these huge corporations so that they can find them something else to do or like maybe not be so evil, right? <laughs> um, I want to build a world where like, like there's nothing that you can make a billion dollars off of, like absolutely nothing, you know? Um, so that we can all have the life that we deserve. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, everyone really liked it. And like, I felt as someone who uses care work, care workers a lot, like I felt very firm because like the, the devaluing of care work is a devaluing of the people who receive it too, right? Um, and uh sometimes yeah it feels like we're off in this little bubble doing all these things every day and like the larger people aren't seeing it as the action that it is so thank you for that um and for Akemi um Akemi's book was released this year and I'm just delving into it um the title is Just Care um, and to address the chat, we'll send out also like, thank you all for populating the chat while your panelists and other questions, um, we'll send out things like the Kemi's book articles that are going in the chat, um, the, all the panelists, um, Instagrams and other social media, um, and maybe some other resources, uh, along with the recording after the event. Um, so Akimi, for your question, um, and I'm still sort of grappling with the concept, but uh, you offer messy dependency as a concept that's beyond independence and maybe even interdependence. Can you explain messy dependency and if and how you understand it as a liberatory tool. Yes, this is Akemi speaking again. I just wanna say, I love what everything Kelly and Wright said, and especially to kind of untangle the ways in which, uh, or disrupt the ways in which activism is like normalized or created the hierarchy of what is actual activism and whatnot, like direct actions on top of that hierarchy which totally ignores all the brilliant things happening in the bed spaces of disabled and sick people. Like we can learn so much from, so I appreciate how both of you are kind of like teaching us so much about it. Um, going back to the question from Kennedy, uh, messy dependency is a word I use a lot and certainly I don't want to claim it. It's, it's something I invented because it's not. I talked to many people who engaged in interdependent care collectives across North America. So I learned the term from them. And also reading the work of disabled artists like Park and Tina or CK, who are actually in the audience tonight, taught me the word like entanglement or messiness of dependency that I talk about. So by messy dependency, what I'm suggesting is a move towards reclaiming the messiness of our dependencies as disability reality. And recognize that as long as our body and mind lives, there will be dependency. We depend on things, people, everything. And it's messy, dependency is messy. And you know, oftentimes if you think about long-term care and as a Medicaid, care workers are assigned to come to your house like nine to 12 as if your care needs or dependency ends magically at the 12 and you'll be independent and okay at the 12 o'clock and till next morning, right? But many people who involved in care collectives, I talk to desire to be entangled in each other's never ending messy dependency than leaving their friends and a loved one in isolation or go through ableism alone. So they're like, you know what? I rather wanna be in this messy, hard, tricky 
dependency of each other together. And I'm not putting forward the word messy dependency to replace interdependence. No, never. Rather, I think both of the word interdependence is one of the principles put forward by disability justice activists instead of independence. Like, how can we do this together? How can we move this together? I think both words are really uh, our advocacy to center disability communities wisdom or try to imagine and a dream together how can we relate to one another or build this society by centering our dependency for each other instead of assuming we all kind of come together as dependent independent means and i put forward you know i advocated to reclaim messiness of, of our dependency because when disability justice activists start talking about interdependence we start kind of using interdependence as a magical words or magical pill. So whenever we talk about how care is capitalized or become this, you know, financial centric, we say we got to do interdependence because interdependence is the answer. Like interdependency became this uh, the container for our dream and hope and all that. But people rarely talks about but how it happens in our everyday life. That's why many disabled and especially disabled queer people start building care collectives to practice interdependence in their everyday lives. And what they learn and what I learned is that practicing interdependency in this independent enforced society is, is full of challenges. It's full of mess. It's hard. It's it burn bridges and it's just it's really hard. And you know, because sometimes when a bunch of disabled people who are traumatized in so many ways came together to care for each other, sometimes we trigger each other left and right, nonstop. It's a mess. So that's one of the things, like uh, the why I came to use the word messy dependency, really because I couldn't think of any other words to really describe what I have witnessed and experienced in care collectives and what I learned from others who engaged in care collectives and to talk about reality of what it means to practice and live the kind of dream we want to see in our everyday lives today. Um, yeah, with that said, of course, interdependent care collective is full of joys too, but also I'm saying all those challenges and a messiness is a part of other world making, is a world part of dreaming in our everyday lives, and it's part of doing disability justice work in this oppression infested world. So um, that's why I'm putting forward this messy dependency as a community knowledge and wisdom. Thank you, Akimi. Um, we want to jump to the Q and A, um, I feel like my neck's gonna hurt from just like nodding at everything y'all have said. Um, we will have time for maybe two or three questions, and I hope people can continue the conversation um, in your own spaces, and um, you can share the recording with folks. Um, the to set up question and answer um, of some quippy social justice facilitator phrases. Um, take space and make space. Um, so like I said, we'll probably only have two or three questions. Um, so feel free to like prioritize one. The Take the lesson, not the story. Um, so if folks share things that are uh, confidential, um, just being sure to share that in a way that like preserves the confidentiality. Um, the devil doesn't need more advocates. Um, please like own your own position. And if you're looking for advice on how to address someone you know who maybe is thinking differently, um, just let us know because the response would probably be different from the person answering the question um, who might feel defensive if you're 
asking as if you're that person. Um, and if you can reflect on whether your question seeks learning or liberation, or if it's coming more from a place of defensiveness or asserting power or appearing smart, whatever that means, right? Um, Anne is gonna read questions from the chat. So maybe we can go back and forth between raised hands and that. Um, if you do raise your hand, we have to unmute you. Uh, it's just a Zoom bomb prevention thing. Um, so sorry if that feels paternalistic. Um, and if everyone could please speak slowly um, and then share your name, uh, pronouns if you use them in a short description before you speak. And I'll drop that in the chat so everyone can refer back to it. Um, anyone, do we have any raised hands or do we wanna start in the chat? You go with the first raised hand. Hi, um, my name is Jamie, she, they. Um, I am light brown skin. I'm wearing some glasses and I have black hair. Um, so I'm a registered nurse. I'm also an intersex woman um, with a mental health diagnosis. So I really appreciate um, this conversation a lot. I wanted to see if folks could expand a little bit on, and it's hard to kind of figure out how to uh, just talk about the question, but we talked about, I think Kelly had um, framed it as how do we get rid of the carceral, the carceral carcerality within medical care while keeping what we need. Um, often I've been in spaces before where, and I've taken it with just full embracing how, um, you know, like the idea of nurses being cops and I carry it with me very, very poignantly. I did, I've done like 10 years of organizing with the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition. So I've like really thought about abolition, but it's really hard to be in these spaces with other nurses that are doing these things. But so the strategies of how do we get it out, you know, of the systems that we sometimes need. Well, my, my first answer, and this is Kelly speaking uh, to that, is not an easy one, which is that um, sometimes it involves breaking rules and that that's just the reality of the situation. Um, I have a number of friends who work in academia who are, you know, mandated reporters who will just straight up tell their students, you can actually tell me what happened and I won't tell anyone unless you tell me to. And so moving in these ways where um, you know rules are definitely being broken is really, I see the only way open to us, right? We can lobby for changes and we need to, right? We can, we can you know, pursue those non-reformist reforms, right? That sort of chip away at the surveillance and at the power over that exists. But at the same time, these rules are there. And if people who are in positions like, you know, teachers, nurses, or really so many places, right? It's so pervasive what's expected of us as people in terms of informing on other people and treating people as though they're prisoners and acting on behalf of the carceral state. We just have to be rule breakers. At some point, we just have to be willing to say, you know, fuck the law. And, um, you know, I've never had a problem with that. That's easy for me to say. I've been a criminal for like my entire adult life you know, sometimes for justice, sometimes not. And so I come by that really easily. I know a lot of folks are concerned about, you know, the things that we all have to worry about, like, you know, paying the bills and whatnot. So these are dicey decisions that get made along the way. But if we look at what's happening to us right now in this country, if we look at the state of things, we cannot afford to be people who draw within the lines, you know, we, we cannot afford to respect the sanctity of rules for the sake of themselves. That's just becoming increasingly true. Um, after Roe fell, I actually trained up and became an abortion doula because as Rise said, you know, care work is direct action. And I think that that is 
only going to become increasingly true, right, in terms of getting trans folks the care they need, in terms of getting folks the abortion care they need, and that we need to think in those renegade terms wherever the fuck we have to in order to make sure that people are okay and that we're doing everything we can to get people out of cages and keep people out of cages. I mean, that's one of my bottom line thinking in anything I do is, does this put someone closer to the control of the carceral state? Does this endanger someone of winding up in a cage? Or am I getting someone closer to safety, closer to people who care about them, closer to what they need to be okay? And thinking in those terms, um, I really wish there were a safe way, right, to resist all of these things. But we really need to be willing to be criminal, to be rule breakers, to be renegades as much as possible. And that's really the only way forward for care work, for anything of value, because this oppressive shit is just going to keep getting worse, right? All of this exists to keep us under control as we are systematically disposed of in orderly ways. And the number of people who are going to be expected to accept disposal in an orderly fashion is only expanding with time. Given the nature of long COVID, given the nature of environmental catastrophe, all of these things. So we are all just going to have to become hardliners against disposability and against the part we play in it. And it's gonna be a lot of little rebellions like lots of little acts of rebellion all the time. But that's what it demands of us. And of course, where we can, doing the work of moving the line and changing the rules and opting ourselves out of those situations. But that's not always going to be possible. So we've just got to be willing to do the things that we're not supposed to do is, is my hard answer to that. Can I add to that? Yeah, Go ahead. Oh, sorry. This is Akemi speaking. And also I want to add how you know, these things you said, nurse as a cop, but also ICE officer, right? Because medical deportation is happening left and right as people who are undocumented go to hospital for treatment. And once treat minimum treatment is done, deportation is waiting for them. So I wanna add to that. And I agree, you know, wholeheartedly with what Kelly said about being aware of rule. You know, I'm reading a lot about abolition feminists who said, who teaches me like, you know, this rule is made to protect whose ass. And we are also told lie, like it's to protect most vulnerable and it's always, you know, oftentimes lie. But to kind of add to what Kelly said, uh, to break rule, rule that's made to protect institutions, I think it's key for us to keep educating ourselves because oftentimes we are the individual who are put on spot to make the, like a decision in the moment. And it's so much, the, the making decision is hard, like where to report, not to report, who, which resource to reach out and what to do. So educating ourselves with these different political idea and activism that's going on and what support system is out there is a key. The other key is to do so collectively. Cause again, it's a lot to fall on one person to decide and to think about consequence and it somewhat take responsibility, right? Like not officially, but informally, you might keep thinking about the person. So having the collective of team of support, like support team for you and for this person, whoever in needs of support is key. And it doesn't need to be the collective at your hospital if you wanna have some anonymity, but have the collective uh, online as Wright said, so much is happening online because collectivity is key for us to do so in sustainable way. And not every uh, stress won't fall onto you as a person who is on the site and dealing with that. So educating ourselves and having some kind of a collective support system with like-minded nurses are another key I wanna point out. Okay, I know we have other questions, but I still want to answer you. Um, so to add on to the lovely things that Kelly and Akemi said, um, go ahead and make you a fuck that system vision board. Um, I'm very much so into um, figuring out how like impossibly grand ideas, you can break that down so that you can put it into practice, like in your everyday life without feeling perpetually overwhelmed 24 seven, right? Because like, 
ab again, like abolition is not going to happen tomorrow, but we can move in a different way tomorrow, right? So like practicing digital safety. So like if you, so like, yes, online movements, yes, but also like there's a lot of ways that um, there are a lot of people that talk about like how to organize online in ways that won't compromise you as much, right? So like different apps that encrypt things, like all of that. Also um, finding you one or more accountability buddies. So people who you can talk to who are on your same wavelength, like, and you can be like, mm, I'm thinking about this or like, mm, let me bounce this idea. Like, what do you think? And in that same vein of accountability, buddy, having people that like know your information so that if something happens and you become in danger, they can care for you or they can like turn up for you, right? Um, what was the other thing I was going to say? Mm -hmm. I forgot. But, <laughs> um, but the, oh, also um, doing practice scenarios with yourself. That was it. So um, either writing out or just like thinking about um, past scenarios that have ha happened and what you did and then being like, okay, if this was to happen now today, what would I do different? What would I do the same? Who would I call on, right? Um, and also thinking about like scenarios that have never happened, but are very likely that they would, right? Like who are those stakeholders? Who are the people that you can trust? Who are the people that you definitely can't, <laughs> right? And then lastly, um, considering your positionality at all times in different settings. So what are the privileged identities you have that will keep you out of trouble and what are the, or help you get out of trouble? And then what are the marginalized identities you have that will more than likely put a target on you where you would need your community or, you know, your safety crew or your pod or your care web to help you, you know, navigate that situation. Thank you all. Um, those were con super concrete. Uh, so that's super helpful. Um, so the chat, I'm so sorry, we're not going to get to all the chat questions. Um, but there was one about everyday examples of care work that fuel you or impact you. Um, and if folks want to address that or give last thoughts, um, and then we'll close out. So in terms of every day, um, it, it's, it's, it's probably not every day in the sense that people think about it, but the ways in which care shows up in the work uh, that I do is really keeps me going. Um, and one of those examples is something that happened back in 2015. Um, my spine had taken a turn for the worse by then, and I was becoming pretty physically disabled. But it made sense for a particular direct action for me to um, be part of a blockade and not simply be the trainer or the action coordinator. For various reasons, we decided it made sense for me to be one of the arrestees, and I wanted that. And we needed to make some adjustments because we were going to be sitting on cold asphalt at the mouth of the Eisenhower in December, and I have a spinal condition. And so we figured out this way to cut out um, a little gym mat and slip it under my ass. <laughs> it would make the whole situation less trying for me. But we also knew that the cops zero in on indications of vulnerability in a blockade situation and that they target people they think are vulnerable because that will get the other people to unlock because they're upset and scared for those people. And so we didn't want the cops to zero in on me like that. So what we did was we made cutouts for all 16 people. And so everyone sat on a little mat instead of sitting on the cold asphalt. And so it didn't occur to the cops that, oh, one of these people is disabled. It was just like, these lawbreakers are comfortable. <laughs> and so I think that there are lots of ways when we think about it, that we can make things a little easier for everybody that actually, you know, give care where it's needed most as well. And I felt so supported during that action that was scary in a lot of ways and a lot of fucked up shit went down that night, but I knew I was deeply cared for by the people around me and that every step of the action was being planned in a way that would 
create as much safety as we could in an unsafe situation. And that's what always inspires me, is that people who are grappling with fundamentally unsafe situations, but finding ways to create as much safety and comfort for each other as they can. And I see that all the time. And I, I'm forever grateful for it. And it's it's what it's the ingenuity that tells me that we we can do whatever is needed of us and that we can get back what Rise was talking about. I, I feel you on that in 2020, that energy we had there for a minute where everyone was listening to disabled voices, it felt like we have that potential. And you know, we, we need to seize our moments when they come, you know. And so I'm I am excited for those opportunities, um, those moments where it's like, hey, we can make everything a little bit better for everyone and a little bit more accessible for everyone. And in doing so, the project is stronger and the people who need the most protection are protected. And so just wanted to name that. Uh, real quick, examples of care work that fuel me or that impact me. Um, disabled people talking shit um, always puts a smile on my face. Um, I was talking to another friend who was disabled and um, talking about like how because we have social media now versus, you know, before we pre pre internet, like we there more and because we're still in a pandemic <laughs> like more disabled people than ever it seems like to me are just not caring anymore and I love that for us right like you want to go to you know the packed bar mask list we're going to talk about you right and like that's not shame that's literally being like why would you do that like, <laughs> like not even you know, not just because you're putting other people at risk, but yourself, like, why would you do that? Care about your life, you know? Um, and so like, and being so blunt and not caring because sometimes, because this is the time that calls for it, right? So like doing what calls for what we need um, brings me to like a state where like, I feel good, I feel seen, even if I'm not the person talking at the moment, or I'm not the person posting or out there, like, no, and then also being vulnerable, allowing people to take care of me, allowing people to feed me, you know, like dismantling these things that are like, I have to do it myself. Otherwise it's, it's not a, a thing, right? No, I can lay down. I can sit someone can text me and that I do not have to immediately reciprocate, you know, to be okay with the situation. Like team, no transactional love, right? Team, no transactional care. Akemi, okay, did you want to add anything? No, right, said everything I kind of wanted to say a million times better. And also it's, I wanna be remind, uh, re mindful of the captioner and ASL interpreters needs to, but thank you so much. Yes, um, thank you for that. Thank you everyone. Um, we will be sending out the recording and resources. Um, Thank you to the co-sponsors again, to our amazing panelists. Um, what a great conversation. Um, and I encourage folks to, um, for the, the things that we didn't talk about in terms of like, build, like what futures we wanna build. Like um, I keep citing Miriam College, sort of like this like figure of abolition, especially for my generation and here in Chicago. And she has a new book, We Do This Till We Free Us. New, like, I think it came out last year. Um, and always talks about um, things worth doing are done with other people. So I think the answer to that question is always um, that we're gonna build it together. So um, yeah, I would just encourage folks to like keep the momentum going in your communities and um, I think the futures that we need are ours to build. So I share deep gratitude for people who participate in that work and are sharing interest in doing so. Um, yeah, have a wrestle evening, everyone. Um, 
and please be in touch. We'll send out info on how to follow uh, the Women's Center and Crip Crap and the panelists. Take care.